Yes. Yes. Do you want for uh, normally what do you do? Do you start straight away or do you wait a few minutes for everybody to join in? Because uh, may we wait uh, just two minutes, sir? Hmm? Well, no, what, what do you decide? What do you decide? Okay. Okay. Yeah. We have a few attendees now. We can wait. Yes. Yeah. Professor Sharma is, is right. We the the number is increasing rapidly. Yeah. They always do. Okay. Nobody joins at that time. And then yeah. within five minutes, everybody is in. Yeah. <laughs> and we are on the face now. We are on the face of Rahman. طيب يعني اعمل ايه؟ يعني يعني باوربوينت يبقى شغال واخرج منه شغل الفيديو How's the weather there? It's nice weather. We are in autumn. It's very nice weather in Egypt now. Yeah, it's not we are hot having... and not cold. Yes, a cold is starting. I, I'm yeah, sure you all have visited in the course. time where <laughs> it's a little bit cold and, you know. We... <laughs> but in in uh, UK, I think it's not freezing in winter. I have no, been in winter. I didn't, bad, I didn't see snow snows. there. Yeah, it, it only snows infrequently. It is the wind, actually. Yeah, yeah. That is more of a problem, to be honest. In, in London now, I think it's a, a beautiful weather now. It is. So yeah, I was in London like in, this uh, till tomorrow. Two years and ago, I was in London in November. It was a very, very nice weather. Mm. Uh, dear Professor Sharma. Yes, sir. Uh, can we start, please, sir? Yeah. Whenever you want me to start, I'll be happy to yes. start. Bismillah rahman rahim uh, It's a great honor to announce the start of the final day of LRS course, uh, which is a very special night containing uh, many uh, guest speakers from uh, UK and from USA and, of course, from Egypt. Uh, our first speaker will be our beloved professor, Professor Sharma from Hull University, will speak about wound infections, diagnostic dilemma. May you start, sir, please? Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening, everybody. I think it's a bit, it's a bit late for you. I think it's a, uh, almost night for you. Uh, 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 today, I'm going to talk about uh, now this whole evening is for bone infection. So my remit is talked about uh, <clears throat> bone infection in sort of more, more in terms of diagnostics. Um, I won't talk about a lot about uh, your radiological uh, um, aspect and particularly PET CT as uh, Shobham is going to talk uh, about this after me. But I will discuss about di different moda modalities available to us and the clinical application and how we struggle with them in terms of uh, a test and also in terms of um, confirmatory diagnosis. And uh, with this, we may end up having a bit of discussion about the about the about the rational approach, how to um, how to treat these patients. So, if we're going to. to there are usually these cases are obvious. This is a plateau fracture. Uh, 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 this is a plateau fracture has been uh, fixed and uh, plate got infected. Very obvious, no problems. Now a problem comes in something like this, where uh, and most common of a problem is the fracture related infections. So a discharge. Uh, at two weeks after surgery, is it infection or is it just normal discharge? And sometimes the discharge is a bit later as well. And, and these are the situations where we struggle. We don't know whether to uh, uh, be aggressive for the surgical treatment or do we just wait and watch. Often we end up starting any antibiotics on the basis that it is a potential infection, but we don't know that. So I'll give you this example. This is a 55 year old lady. Uh, she had number of years episodes of pain in the distal femur. Sometimes you get antibiotics, which improves. Sometimes she improves on its own. And as a child or as a teenager, she had a fracture. She thinks she might have infection. She has no idea. The surgery was such a long time ago. And so these are the 
a, a bit more difficult situations. So as you can see, there's a knee arthritis in the previous x-ray medial compartment. So we gave a knee injection that improved the pain in the knee, but not in the distal femur. A blood tests are normal. Now, what do we do? Is it infected? The, the, this is the MRI. We suggest there is uh, problem, the sign of previous surgery. So, so somebody must have done something. And there is collection. Is it infection? We don't know that. And these are the kind of situations we sometimes struggle. And what is available to us? There are quite a few things available to us to look for diagnosis. Cost, why it is important? Because we need to ensure that we treat these patients properly because it's very expensive uh, if patients get infected. And this cost is going to increase quite significantly uh, by the end of this year, up to 1.62 billion, which is a massive amount of money. Um, uh, which and, and a lot of this can be saved by just uh, uh, improving our diagnostics and treating these patients differently. We can't eliminate it, but we can certainly improve it. So uh, in the consensus group, they looked at it early versus real late infection in the factor related infection. And they, and they suggested less than two weeks is early. And uh, as I mentioned, it's, it, it's difficult to diagnose as often the symptoms are no different uh, from the post of leakage or problems, which we normally find. Late, when there is a pus and there's obvious things, is, it, it becomes relatively easier to diagnose it. And there is a very little evidence in terms of how to manage these patients. <clears throat> there was an initial consensus between AO Foundation and European Bone and Joint Infection Society, and they published their outcomes a couple of years ago. And later on, they have another consensus. This time they included Orthopedic Trauma Association and Pro Implant Foundation, and they published their outcome earlier part of this year. The idea of the consensus was to standardize the diagnostics, which is important, and improve the quality of the uh, patient care. That was the whole idea, and to streamline the research. That was the whole idea of this consensus. So what they said was, uh, any fistula open wound communicating bone implant, pus pouring out, and two similar positive cultures, two similar phenotypically similar cultures confirms it is an infection. Histology, uh, uh, along with it, which I'll talk about a little bit later separately, at, that also is very helpful and um, in, in confirming the, 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 the infection. And that's in, into the deep tissue. There's a lot of things which you use in our day-to-day -day practice, clinical signs, pain, redness, local swelling. Then we look at a lot of radiological signs. We sometimes a single culture is positive. We, we, we always do routine bloods. And all this along with a person or new discharge are just the probable signs of diagnosis of fracture related infection. These are not confirmatory signs. In imaging, there are a number of uh, modalities available. Um, and if you look at the sensitivity and the specificity, they all vary. And as I said, I won't talk about it more because Shobhan is going to talk about after me about it. But the white cell scan is, with spec CT seems to have uh, best sensitivity and specificity in the, in the literature, which was published in the systematic review. Is biopsy helpful? Maybe it can be helpful. This is a patient had a spontaneous <clears throat> humeral pain. They thought it was the secondaries. They took a biopsy and it turns out it is infection. Then sometimes does it help to make a decision? This is a, a fracture, this is a polytrauma, fracture of distal femur who had a plate and it got, uh, it ended up with a non-union with, with some discharge a couple of times. And, the, and these are your CT pictures. Now, is it infection or not? Because if it is infection, we try to avoid internal fixation. If it is not infection, we can do the internal fixation. So I did a biopsy. It was positive, so I went in the external fixation. Is that confirmatory? There is no way to say it is because single biopsy cannot confirm it is infection or not. So what does single uh, bi bi closed one biopsy we do for? We do for to confirm an infection 
And that will help us decide whether we can do an internal or external fixation. Because often if we do an internal fixation in a, a infected areas, we tend to do a two-stage procedure. We need to decide about what antibiotics we're going to give at times. We also need to decide what local antibiotics we'll mix uh, locally, for example, in Stimulan and to uh, give us the best chance of success. And we also decide about, this, about, this, about the systemic antibiotics. Unfortunately, it's got poor yield. And generally, it is not advised that to do it because it doesn't help the manage the patient any better. And my suggestion would be, if you are in doubt, then treat it like infection as you would treat any infection. What about the serum markers? In leukocyte count increase initially and then uh, they, they tend to settle within a week. CRP increases in first couple of days, it peaks and then becomes normal in two weeks. And ESR, as we all know, as we all know, goes up slowly and it settles slowly, it takes about six weeks for it to come back to normal. Of the all the things, CRP seems to be the most useful with with decent sensitivity and specificity, but it's quite variable. In general, all three of them have very limited value and they are not helpful in the diagnosis. In, in my unit, we don't use them either for diagnosis. We sometimes use for monitoring a treatment or sometimes when there's a recurrence of a problem, that is sometimes helpful, but we don't use them routinely in a practice. We have just about to publish a study of quite a large series and we found that again, it, it wasn't useful. What about the tissue sampling? As uh, it, it is recommended, which is our practice as well for a number of years, that no antibiotic should be given for at least two weeks uh, prior to surgery to get the best chance of uh, uh, growing the bugs we need to take at least five to take deep tissue samples from all across the wound, from all areas of the wound. They need to be taken by separate instruments so to avoid the cr cross contamination. And there is a study to suggest that up to half can be contaminated in, the, in, in prosthetic joint infection if we are not careful. So sampling is extremely, uh, extremely crucial and how to take it. We do not recommend, and I think there is no point doing this uh, superficial sampling from the skin sinus tract or any of the superficial wounds. It's an ever, it doesn't help you, it doesn't grow the right bacteria and it can mislead you and it's a waste of money. So no superficial samples. We looked at it uh, and published about the sampling techniques and we looked at it and how to, improve your, your yield in the sampling. So the number of things, how do you take the sample? How many samples you take? Sonification helps in some situations. How you transport? How do you process in the lab? What about the host? What type of bacteria are you growing? Fast growing or slow growing? All samples should be incubated for at least seven days, ideally for 14 days. Uh, what kind of biofilm is that? Do, 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 are we using techniques to break the biofilm? All that is useful to uh, understand and to improve a, a, a yield. And you will find that there are a number of reports suggesting that the positive sample is only in about 60% of the patients, but it can be improved significantly depending on how you, uh, by, uh, by, the, uh, by, by following the right technique and principles um, for, for the culture and sensitivity. This is quite important because this is the most common procedure we all do and it's extremely important we do it properly because uh, an, a negative sample does not mean there is no infection. Sonification in, uh, there is, is it, it is suggested that it could be um, um, better, but most of the studies recently come out uh, do not support this idea. Uh, it is a very labor intensive technique. And if you see the uh, in fracture related in infections, tissues are better. And, uh, and the recently public, published systematic review suggested that it has got limited evidence and, uh, and tissue sample is possibly the, the better thing to do. 
What about the molecular methods? They can be helpful to help in a diagnosis. The problem is, is a very, very high resolution and is increased sensitivity. And therefore there's an increased number of, uh, uh, for increased number of false results. Excuse me. It is not you use it routinely in mo in mo in most hospitals in in the clinical practice for a number of reasons, and one of the reasons is that it cannot provide the the, the sensitivities. It tells you there's a bacteria, whether there's a alive or dead, it doesn't tell you, but it can it can tell you there is a bacteria. It can identify the the organism. What about the histology? This is quite an uh, quite a neglected thing. Uh, and I think I highly recommend that, that that should be done in every infected or potentially infected patients, along with your sampling for the um, uh, culture and sensitivity, the histology should be taken. And Oxford, this is a study in, in non-unions and they found, they looked at more than five PMF in uh, uh, every high power field and they found complete absence has got high correlation with no infection and more than five uh, PMF in every high, uh, high power field is always associated um, with uh, infection and very high sensitivity and specificity. And along with clinical science and cultures, the, uh, it has got a very, very good uh, diagnostic accuracy and almost 97% of the cases it can diagnose. So this should be uh, um, very underused and I highly recommend it that it should be used routinely in a practice. What about some new things? Uh, B, B, B cells from, uh, um, sorry, there, is, um, uh, there are, Staph aureus has been very common infection and the most common infection. And there are some immunoassays which can be, um, uh, which can be isolated. And what it does is it, uh, it, it can give you the diagnosis and it predicts the uh, uh, infection and also the management it, uh, it can help with. Now, from the B cells, from, from lymph nodes, there is uh, these is antibodies are secreted, these called antibody secreting cells. These antibody secreting cells are called ASCs, can be isolated and uh, grown. And this uh, media enriched for newly synthesized antibodies called MENSA is a measurable uh, indicator and is a direct indicator of ongoing infection. It can diagnose the infection, it can uh, monitor the treatment response, and it can detect the persistent or the failure of the treatment and also detect the recurrence of the infection. This is something new, which has been uh, you, 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 you usually there's a um, uh, very little in vivo and what uh, apart from uh, some um, it is mainly done in labs and but they've been tested in the diabetic feeds and they have found that it is quite a helpful uh, modality in, in the diabetic feed but is not being used in a wider clinical practice. The why they are sometimes difficult to diagnose and why to get recurrence? There are a number of reasons we can have. One is a biofilm, one is a, um, uh, they, 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 they get pulled together. The other thing is that you, you find, which is something new recently reported is that the colonization of, of osteocytes lacuna canaliculi, what it does, so although osteos, uh, um, staphylococcus is not a, a a mobile bacteria, but from some active process, it actually reaches the uh, osteocyte and goes in, into the canaliculi. And if you see these uh, red arrows are showing the, the canaliculi and what the dose, the, these black uh, arrow shows is, they actually can move from the canaliculi and move into different canaliculi. So they may not be accessible to the surgeons directly. And either for uh, excision or for the biopsy at times. And they also, as you know, there are, they can live in the cells and they can travel in the leukocytes within the host, although it's not validated as yet. So there are a number of things and this diagram shows all four of them, they're within the cells, they're the biofilm in the canaliculi at the bottom there, and there's a collection and 
uh, what you call SAP. And all these in combination uh, are the reasons that sometimes diagnosis can be difficult. And they certainly, it looks like that there's a reason why we get uh, recurrence despite doing everything. The standard of care for all osteomyelitis is a single stage management. However, if you cannot manage a single stage, then two stages is acceptable and it's got similar results and the principles are the same. So in summary, uh, uh, routine bloods, single biopsy are not very useful and uh, bloods can be useful in sometimes in post of monitoring, but generally they are not, um, uh, uh, should be relied on very much. Scans can be helpful and uh, uh, you, you'll talk, uh, you, you will hear about that in the next uh, uh, talk soon. Deep tissue culture is still considered to be the gold standard, but we must follow the principles in terms of how to acquire, transport, and you use them in the labs. All that is, is in combination, is helpful for us to uh, improve our diagnostics. And histology along with this, very helpful. And the combination of this give us very high diagnostic accuracy. And if in doubt, if you're not sure, treat it like it's infection, you always be safe and you always be right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you, you very so much, Professor Sharma. Dr. Ahmed Sheikh, you can have the yeah. questions, please. Uh, thankfully, it's a, a, the, I think the topic of infection is full of questions, but uh, I think our dear attendees don't, don't have any at the moment, which is a good thing at the moment, just to carry on to the next talk. Um, I, I might, yeah, I just, uh, I would ask about the last slide about the single stage. Uh, we, we would take this very cautiously in the uh, um, uh, developing countries. Uh, I, I think that Professor Alam also would agree with me that that might not be the our uh, our best shot sing, single stage. Uh, I think the whole uh, healthcare system would allow you to, to do this with specific requirements. But uh, here, I think for many reasons about the virulence, we get many, many uh, gram negative uh, bacilli infection rather than the, the, the usual stuff that we used to, to do, which would go a bit against the uh, using uh, single stage. So this would be my just uh, a, a bit disagreement about the, the single stage as gold standard. What, how would you uh, appreciate this point? No, and I think, see, um, we have moved from two stage to single stage because uh, uh, we have managed our, our infection profile is is certainly different. We get uh, much less resistant or multiple drug resistance bacteria. So for us, is is probably a little bit easier. We also have access to the um, stumulan and uh, cerement or bone life, which is quite expensive, and that is again is also quite helpful. However, I think uh, <laughs> even in the in the, uh, in the in Egypt and where. Um, where, because I think the, the principles of the debridement and, and the obliteration of the, of the dead space is important, plus local antibiotics. Now, if you can deliver antibiotics in any form, if you have a uh, profile of the, um, because we all start with a, a broad spectrum. And so therefore, I, can, I think you can still do it uh, for, for, for a lot of these cases. But again, if you think that is, uh, would be hard, then two stages equally good is just more expensive for the patient and more morbidity for the patient and is expensive to the health system. So I think in if you can change it to single stage and in the countries like Egypt and India where the health healthcare system is not good, patient end up paying, it is more of a reason that we should go for single stage to, uh, to do the cost saving for the patient. Thanks so much. Um, another question about the duration of the culture for atypical bacteria and TB. Uh, how, how can we overcome according to the antibiotic choice? I can't really un and fully uh, appreciate the, the target of the question. Duration of the culture for atypical bacteria and antibiotic choice. Now, the, the current culture is you take Lucy Johnson and that takes about six weeks. 
histology can tell you if, if there's a mycobacteria or not. What it doesn't tell you is, is it atypical or it doesn't tell you that uh, what is the sensitivity. Now, we, we recently published actually about three months ago on the uh, osteoarticular tuberculosis, and I can send you the article. And the idea was we looked at it and the one of the reasons we found that we have gotten multiple drug resistance uh, bacteria, uh, tuberculosis infection is because of this empirical approach. Now, part of it is related to the cost because not everybody can afford and we don't have systems. Uh, the, there are some new, new, newer devices and systems are available uh, like Accept and which can um, do the cultures uh, much more quickly. But ultimately, the currently it is unfortunately only six weeks. And unless, if you can, you should always start it after the culture, but I can understand it's not always possible. Um, um, ESR, CRP, CBC, they got already limited rule. Is there anything for in exclusion or confirmation? I, I think you have already. I'm not, uh, uh, we, we don't use it regularly. And uh, uh, I think it's just, uh, it may be worthwhile doing post-op because if you're not sure that will, it will help you. So for example, you take a CRP, it goes up in first couple of days and start coming down back to normal up to two weeks. If it is not going back to normal, keep, keeping high, then there's, it has some monitoring um, value in the sense that you, you need to look at things differently. Maybe infection is not settling down or something else is going on. Yeah, um, just this will be the last question. Um, I think it's uh, just some, some point that we need to clarify because some of the colleagues ask about two weeks without antibiotic before the culture. Is that a long time? There will be some empirical antibiotic till we get the results of the culture. Aren't we, Prof? Okay, no, so what I think I, what I'm saying is prior to surgery. So no antibiotics before the surgery yep. until you have taken the samples in the theater. Once you take the samples, you start a broad spectrum antibiotic yep. and carry on until cultures are available, then alter it accordingly. Yeah. So uh, it is the pre-op, not the post-op. Uh, and I uh, just to name the the empirical protocol, uh, we we used to uh, use in Liverpool uh, the tycoplanin and ciprofloxacin. Uh, is it that different to what you have in Hull University, for instance? So we use uh, uh, quite often we use tezosin, right? Yeah. And uh, for 4.5 5 grams three times a day. If we have an implant, we use vancomycin and tycoplanin. Reason yeah. we, we we don't use cipro is because uh, anything which related to C has some incidence of uh, Clostridium difficile infections, mm -hmm. right? So, and we have quite a big, up, uh, quite a bit of a problem with 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 C diff infections. So we have stopped use or uh, all tefuroxim and clindamycin and and cipro. We, we we use cipro from time to time, but our protocol is vanco and tycoplanin. If, I, Thanks if so there much. is a metal, if there is no metal, then then tezosin. tezosin. Thanks so much, Prof, for such a, a rich discussion. Um, now we are uh, going to the next speaker, our uh, dear guest, uh, Professor uh, Subhan Benjamouri, Professor of Nuclear Medicine, uh, uh, Liverpool, and the past president of the British Nuclear Medicine Society. Thanks so much for accepting the invitation, Prof, and happy to see you here. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, good, okay. And you can see my slides? Yes. Okay, good, brilliant when technology works, good. So I looked at the program, it looks very nice, very comprehensive, and uh, I also see that Badri is around, so he can do the talk better than me, but uh, anyway, it's good, good to have Badri on side as well, supporting us. So this talk, we're going to, I can't advance my slides, is it? Uh, uh, ju just to click on the on the presentation itself to activate its control and then it will. Ah, okay, yes. good. Thank you. Right. So, as we know, we, we talked about imaging in the previous talk, and the particular challenges that we come across are low-grade infections because some of the obvious ones you don't need any tests for, and when you dig down, you then want to know whether it's beyond soft tissue is bone involved. 
And that's, those are the frequent questions we get asked. We know this patient has got an infection. Can you define the extent? Can you define the, the site of infection? So what we want to do is to have a very good quality CT scan first, because as you might be uh, familiar with some of the previous nuclear medicine imaging, we used to provide good tests, but the anatomy was not that great in the past. So we were, we were always saying somewhere on the left side, somewhere in the foot region, and it was never good enough. So we have, we have learned the lessons and we first thing is to insist on a good quality CT. The patient needs to be well prepared. And you know the radioactive isotope that we give is half the amount that we give for a cancer patient for FTG scan. So, so you should not be too particularly too worried about the radiation dose. The blood glucose level should be of the order of eight to 12, ideally less than 12. And this is one of the key things. So we, talk, we heard about how acute infections are a challenge. They'll continue to be a challenge for functional imaging. So one of our criteria is we said we want to look at only chronic infections because that's the, that's the role for FTG PET in particular. If you want to look for acute infections, then we've got other tests, but uh, this, this talk, we're going to focus more on chronic infections. And we've slowly brought that duration down. We've, uh, our orthopedic colleagues have been very pushy and they, we've brought down the duration to four months now because they said, well, we can't wait for one year. So we, we've been, we've been uh, particularly uh, useful even when the surgery is as short as four months in the past. I think the clinical context is very important, as I said before. So it, it depends on the question. If you say, I know this patient is infected and I know what to, and I know, want to know the extent, is a different question to, is this patient infected or not? Because all the other tests are not conclusive. And again, you, your, your answer will be different depending on the question you ask. So high sensitivity as ever, FTG, which is a glucose analog, will go to anything that lights up uh, using up more glucose. And it could be predominantly gram positive, it could be gram negative, it could be an even inflammatory change. And the specificity therefore depends on the clinical question being asked. But the more important value, I suppose, from a, from a clinical point of view is a high negative predictive value. If the scan is completely normal, then you are assured and your patient can be assured that there's nothing sinister going on. You probably can watch and, watch and wait for a few more months or so on. So you need good anatomy, multiple recons, sensitivity, good resolution. And, and for those of us who have been championing even white cell scans, the quality of the images is, is you know, really good. And as I said, the, there are, every test has its place. So this particular test, we are, we are push, pushing it only for chronic infections. <coughs> and it's a quick single scan rather than coming back after 24 hours or 48 hours, which some of us have to do for the white cell scans. We gave fused images in three planes and we gave a high resolution CT image, which is also quite useful for you guys when you're looking at patients. Anatomical areas, obviously, if you've got a very difficult patient to, to position, it can be challenging. And you know, you guys know your anatomy better than anybody else. So, you know, we, we just need to be careful uh, when we interpret it. And specificity. So here is where a lot of people say, well, FTG. Why are you using it? Well, actually, in a particular clinical context, we can actually use this to our advantage. So you're not particularly bothered about tumor in the, in the area that you're looking at to operate. And the question of infection versus inflammation has also got additional clinical tests that you can rely on. So you do not really need to rely on purely the FTG scan, which I hope to show you in a few of the examples. Obviously, we've got more tracers coming. They'll be more specific, but for the moment, we are where we are with the FTG scans. So I've got a few cases, so you can stop me when we've reached our time limit if you want to allow more discussion, but these cases can go on. So again, this is something which is very interactive, but ideally we, we can pause for a minute. An amputee presenting with pus. So no question of there not being an infection. There's an ulcer, there's an infected ulcer, it's not healing. So the clinical question is not, is there infection or not? The clinical question is, is there bone involvement? And I hope you can look at this and you can say, well, yes, the soft tissue is involved, but actually the bone's not involved. 
So this is all likely to be soft tissue infection and you can go ahead and with, you could, with a very limited surgical option rather than going to the bone. Soft tissue infection. So this is again, chronic osteomyelitis post open fracture 30 years ago. So, and patient is presenting with increasing pain and difficulty walking, query focus, query extent. So this is a little bit more challenging because again, you're asking a diagnostic question rather than an extent question, which is more important. So is this a delayed post-surgical change, delayed inflammatory change, or this infection? So you might still want to back up with your biopsy, consider needle aspiration. I would still back that up. But what does the imaging show? I don't know if you can, if this projects well, but I hope you can see that this is the focus that is lighting up on the PET scan and you can go, you've got the very good anatomy that shows where exactly it is in the tibia. So as a surgeon, you can easily look at this and say, hang on, you know, this is where I know 30 years after the surgery, what else can it be? It is an infective focus. So focus of intense uptake in the left tibia, chronic osteomyelitis, and it could be low grade, but that's again a clinical diagnosis as you can imagine. Patient with severe back pain, loss of sensation and movement in lower limbs. So we get a lot of referrals from a spinal team. The spinal implant was 10 years ago. So again, you guys know this. If, if you want to go into a, a spinal implant and possible infection of a spinal implant, it's quite invasive. Most of the investigations are negative. The patient has got pain. We need to provide an answer. And you can see here, so we've reconstructed them specifically and you can see this part is lighting up. And in the context of the patient having pain, this is not likely to be a vertebral collapse, but because it's lighting up, what else can it be 10 years after the surgery? It's not going to be an infect inflammation, it's going to be an infection. So again, severe back pain, other investigations inconclusive, 12 years post-surgery, low-grade infection. Is it, is it a low-grade infection? And you've got your CT, high-resolution CT. You can make something of it, but when you've got this, it actually provides reassurance. So this is a very common setting where you might want to use a test with a high negative predictive value to say there is nothing abnormal there so it is not, the pain that you have is not related to the implant. So we can watch and wait or we can have conservative management. So, so remember we're, we're talking about a high negative predictive value test rather than a positive predictive value. This patient has had a, a fracture of the femur 20 years ago. So again, there's a pus. So you don't need a test to tell you that it's infection or not. It is infection, but what is the source? And you can see this very clearly. There's a, there's a superficial tracking ulcer, tracking uh, uh, sinus, and it's going into the bone. And you can see very clearly. So as a surgeon, you should be able to easily plan and say, okay, this is what is causing the infection to the patient. I know what's happening here. I've got a plan for this. So we upload all these images to PAX so that our orthopedics colleagues can actually look at them because I think the, the more you try to report this in a factual way, it's never going to match the image that comes up on PACS. So this is something that, you know, we make it as a routine where you get the, the, the PACS image of the fused PET CT as well as the high quality, high resolution CT that goes along with this. So this patient now we're getting, we, remember we I said, we're cutting down the duration now. So we came from 30 years to 20 years to, to now 14 months, so now we're pushing the boundaries. 14 months post knee replacement, increasing pain, x-rays are normal, three negative aspirations. And again, you can see here, so there is some low grade uptake, but if you look at the pattern and the intensity is very similar to what we would normally see elsewhere in terms of vascular activity. So this is more likely to be loosening rather than infection. So again, this patient had a left tibial fracture, appears to be infected, requires excision. Can we tell us the degree of bony involvement? I mean, this looks messy even by my standards, but I'm, I'm sure you guys are used to images like this before. So you can immediately see this. Once you see these images, you know that what else can cause an infection, an abnormal activity, abnormal signal in the path of all the metal work 
that has been there. So you can see multifocal infection. So this patient needs a little bit more aggressive approach. We have a big cohort of patients with diabetic feet. Again, your question is not whether this is infection or not. So, so the reason I keep stressing that is because the whole downfall of FTG is the point that you cannot make out the difference between inflammation and infection. But my point is, you already know whether this patient has got inflammation or infection. So we do not particularly worry about the, the sensitivity or the specificity in this context. So again, you can see over here, this very clearly shows the superficial soft tissue activity. We're not looking at infection of the bone. So the bone is not involved in the process. You already know this is infection from the visual and clinical examination. So that's, that's what this test tells you. Right knee amputation for a serious open fracture, serious open fracture, new discharge. So what else can be the discharge? It is an infection, but is it superficial or deep? And instantly you can see that the bone is not involved. I think this patient, no recent surgery, failed multiple fixation. Is there low grade infection? And yes, even now you, you are now experts in interpreting FTG PET CT scans because you've now looked at 10 more than ev everybody else. So you can see that, yeah, it is very clearly that this patient has got a multifocal infection. I think this is the last case. Uh, the sinus over the left distal tibia is there, what is the extent? And you can see the bone is not involved. So you can be assured that all of this is soft tissue activity. And sometimes you can see a bit of joint activity as well. So you might have a bit of soft tissue communicating with the joints, but not necessarily with the bone. So coming back to the technique, the patients fasted and a lot of worries about antibiotic usage, a lot of worries about uh, whether the blood glucose level uh, is any important. In the cancer world, when we're doing the FTG scans, the blood glucose level is very important, but in the orthopedic setting, it's not that important. So when we looked at it, we felt that it, it didn't actually make any difference, the blood glucose levels. And the antibiotic uh, question is also uh, something that we, we do not insist too much on. I mean, ideally, we would like to have a scan without the patient being on antibiotics, but if the patient uh, has already been on antibiotics and if the patient still has pus, then uh, we'll get on with it and do the scan. So, so, so some of the limitations that we would normally associate with uh, very highly sensitive technique, but not specific enough, we can go around by actually having a very good detailed clinical uh, portfolio, clinical picture picking up. So in conclusion, I hope that, you know, from these 11 cases, uh, you have seen that FDG PET CT is versatile and effective. You need to carefully use it uh, and you have to in interpret it in the multidisciplinary context because if you, if you let it into the community without proper vetting of the cases, because some of the cases, if, if the question comes back, is this infection or is the patient, does the patient have infection or not? We actually turn the case back because we say, if you're not planning to do surgery, then we, we really do not want to do, the, do a test that is not going to help your answer. So. So most of the cases we do are actually patients who have actually planned for surgery in the near future so that we can answer the question that you ask. So I hope that has helped and I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks so much Prof, for, uh, for such a great uh, lecture really. It's about the how can we use the PCT in the best case scenario. Some of the questions we'll give, we'll put some lights over uh, some of the questions. The yep. infection, and bone remodeling after surgery, or in another way, uh, a post-operative patient, how, how much time shall we leave before requesting PET-CT if you are suspecting something because is there any reaction coming from the inflammation post-surgery or what? Yeah, so, so. This, this is what I was uh, hinting at. So when we started off, we said very clearly, don't, don't do the scan till 12 months so that yeah. we, can, we can have, uh, we can avoid that post-surgical inflammation change. But our, our colleagues have been pushing the boundaries and 
we've done many patients at four months. Uh, and even there, yeah. we have been able to provide an answer. So ideally, I would say, you know, wait as long as you can, uh, ideally closer to 12 months or more. But in a few cases, in exceptional cases, we have done a few at around four months, certainly not less than four months, because you, then you cannot differentiate post-surgical infl inflammatory change from infection, and then the test would be completely useless. So, so I, I distinctly make sure that when we are actually injecting the radioactive isotope, that the patient has not had recent surgery because then this is not the test that will answer the question. Yeah, uh, two, two more spots, Charcot joint, um, how to differentiate between infection and inflammation. Uh, they, are, they may get some uh, a bit yes. close clinical appearance, yes. Yes. especially in Charcot joint. Is there any yeah. tip yeah. for so, this? When we've done a few patients of Charcot joints and what we've seen is if, it, if the activity is much more diffuse uh, and much more uniform, then it's more likely to be the inflammatory change. The moment, but the moment we see some focal activity, we say that this is likely to be infection. Uh, so, so that is the only way. So we, we have to look at the distribution of the activity. And if it is very uniformly increased throughout all the, wow. the feet joints, we would say more likely to be inflammatory change. But if it is focal, more likely to be infected. Yeah. Uh, the other topic, which is non-unions, and it has been some debate about the uh, SUV uh, cut value to say if this is non-united fracture, which is calm clinically, do you suspect low-grade infection or not? And this is, again, something that I would like to hear more about. It. Yes. So we, we looked at SUV max, uh, which is, uh, for, for those of you who do not know, SUV uh, is standardized uptake value. It, it indicates how much of the injected activity has gone into the abnormal area. And uh, in cancer, it's a very useful tool to look at diagnosis and for monitoring response. But in the orthopedics uh, infection world, we, don't, we have found no correlation at all. So, so we have moved away from reporting on SUV and we just look at patterns, as I said before, is if it's a more diffuse pattern, more likely to be inflammatory, more focal, more like more and more likely to be infective. So SUV max has got no correlation with uh, whether it's inflammation or infection. Uh, and we know that from the biology as well. Yeah, uh, two questions about using it in the follow-up after surgery. Uh, I expect that they ask about uh, treating infection and doing PET-CT later to, uh, to, to make sure that the infection has settled or not. Uh, I'm not sure if, if, if we are going to do such similar thing or this regarding the cost and the. Uh, yeah, I don't, the... Think, I don't think you should use this in that setting because you know this is a very specialized test and you're going to take away another patient who needs this test for that. So I would yeah. not recommend routinely if you're only if you're suspecting clinically this patient has got infection, only then you should be using it. Please do not use it for routine monitoring. Otherwise, you know the test is going to. You, you, first yeah. of all, you're going to add cost to the patient yeah. pathway and you're going to add uh, more complexity because you might find things that you don't want to find also. So better to not ask. So I, I would not recommend it routinely. Yeah, uh, this will be the last question. The advantages of PET-CT over the MRI in absence of implants with the MRI, it's known that it's good sensitive also. Is the advantages of PET-CT over MRI? No, so I think I would, I would not put one against the other. I'm a big fan of complementary imaging, correlative imaging. So one of my first requests when uh, you know, we were discussing with our orthopedics team was to say, let us get the MSK radiology team involved because they should not feel that we are competing with them. We are, we are not. So we are, we are looking at a different biology and a different setting. And they, they have got enough non-specific markers for within MRI. They, they will look at some things. They look at edema as a surrogate marker. They look at different signals. So I think if I were being smart, I would use the tests together in particular algorithms. If, you, if you're thinking of doing a surgery preoperatively, sorry, before uh, you, would, you would do a PET-CT. Afterwards, if you want to do for peace of mind, you might do an MRI. So I think you have to use the techniques at your disposal appropriate. I don't think you should compete with each other. Uh, and in the setting that we are using, all our uh, patients had support from the MSK radiology team because, you know, that is one of the first things I said. They need to be happy that we're doing the FTG scans. They should not feel that we are 
taking away patients from them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, really, thanks so much. It's, it's very rich discussion because it's the, 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 the major conclusion that <laughs> you have to know what are the questions that you would have the answers for. Otherwise, it won't be necessary to request something that you would not use it in the best case scenario. Absolutely, thank you. Thanks so much, Prof, for accepting the invitation again. Thank you. Prof Alam, would you like to uh, uh, present yes. Prof Antar? We have here our dear friend, Professor Muhammad Antar, and his. Thank you, my dear professor. Thank nice you talk about coronavirus myelitis. Because myelitis, I have tried hard to concise this uh, topic, hot topic in Egypt. Coronavirus myelitis is a daily practice for us, for all of us, especially you, <laughs> uh, Dr. Ahmed Alam, Dr. Ahmed Al Sheikh. Uh, let's begin. Yes, please. Yeah. I'll talk about uh, the management. Management means definition, uh, pathology, pathogenesis, uh, diagnosis, and treatment. I'll cut short in uh, in uh, in, in diagnosis and uh, imaging and uh, investigations because our two professors from England have uh, uh, explained it uh, uh, very clearly. Uh, Osmolytis is an inflammation of the bone due to infections that can be limited to a single portion of, uh, of the bone or can involve several regions such as marrow, cortices, uh, preostium, and surrounds of tissue. Symptoms duration must be of six weeks to three months. Re-established sequestrum or bone deformities. Epidemiology, between 4% and 64% uh, Best of open lung bone fractures and about 1% to 2% of prosthetic jo uh, joints are complicated by infection. The rate of infection after revision joint replacement surgery is much higher. Uh, even with advances in antimicrobial, antimicrobial therapy and surgery for chronic osteomyelitis, a recurrence rate of about 20% to 30% is reported. Cause of organisms, number one bacteria, Staph is the most common, streptococci and gram-negative uh, uh, pathogenesis. Salmonella is common in sickle cell diseases. Polymicrobial infection is frequent in trauma. Coagulase negative uh, staphylococci are also uh, exclusive in implant-related osmolytis. E. coli uh, in genitourinary uh, 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 tract infection and intravenous drug user. Pseudomonas infection clepsiella and aerobes are rare. In diabetic food, a polymicrobial uh, organisms with mixed gram positive gram negative bacteria, aerobes and in aerobes. Number two, fungi. Uh, in patient with intravenous drug abuser, skull osteomyelitis. Number three, parasites. Uh, number four, skeletal syphilis and tuberculosis osteomyelitis. Pathogenesis, biofilm, is a recent theory for chronic osmolytis. Bacteria adherent to the bone matrix via receptor. Then collagen and laminin and other structure proteins by developing a biofilm. In biofilm, pathogens undergo complex metabolic changes and become less susceptible to the immune system and antibodies. This is the way of formation of biofilm. Bacteria adhesion to the surface. Then biofilm formation by adhesion to laminin and fibrocytin. Then other organisms are invited to the biofilm and multiply inside this coating areas. Then release of blanketonic bacteria, which covered by the surfaces, which protect it from the immune system and from the antibodies. How, how uh, osmolite is done? There is patch ischemia uh, of the bone. The necrosis occurred due to vascular occlusion of the small uh, blood vessels. Segment of bone devoid uh, of the blood supply can become separated and called sequestrum or sequestra. There is reactive hyperemia with increased osteoclastic activity at the periphery of the infarct area. New preosteal bone formation called involucrum. This is a classification of the chronic osmolytis, which is uh, much uh, more users uh, classification with Cerny and the mother staging system. Type one medullary endoposteal disease. Uh, 
زين جريد تايب 2 سوبرفيشال كورتيكال ستيج زين ستيج 3 لوكلايز كورتيكال سيكوسترام ذات كان بي اكسايد ويزاوت كومبرس الستابيليتي زين ستيج 4 ديفيوز اوف اوسمايز هاو ابوت ديجنوزيز The patient history of systemic symptoms like lethargy, malaise, extremity, or back pain, fever, predisposing factor also present like diabetes, peripheral vascular disease, history of trauma, open fractures, intravenous drug user, sickle cell anemia, addiction. Diagnosis, clinical signs, chronic pain, exposed bone, persistent sinus tract, tissue necrosis, overlying bone, chronic wound, over surgical hardware, coronary wound over lying the fracture, laboratory evaluation, both of blood culture, elevated C-reactive protein, elevated erythrocyte segmentation ratio, culture and sensitivity test. Culture, like Professor Sharma has uh, uh, explained it very, very good. The preferred diagnostic criteria for osteomyelitis is positive bacteria culture from bone biopsy, in the setting of the bone necrosis, samples are taken from the deeper tissue and the pain biopsy, and the bone biopsy are preferred over swabs. The tissue samples should be subjected to anaerobic, aerobic, fungal, and the mycobacterial culture in all cases, not to miss any type of positive organisms. Imaging. Diagnosing imaging and sensitivity, which Mr. Hermit Sharma has explained. CT, leukocyte scintigraphy, magnetic resonance image, billion X-rays, BET, technetium 99 bone scintigraphy. What are the findings on the X-ray and the osteomyelitis, chronic osteomyelitis? There is regional osteopenia, Periosteal reaction, thickening, endosteal scalloping, loss of the trabecular bone, architecture, new bone abposition, peripheral sclerosis, and chronic untreated cases, there is sequestrum, uh, sequestrum, involcrum, or colwaca may be also seen. After X ray, CT, the role of CT in the diagnosis of osteomyelitis is limited. Although CT is superior to MRI detecting necrotic fragment of the bone, CT should use only to determine the extent of bone destruction, especially in the spine, and to guide the biopsy or on patient with contraindication to MRI. What is the role of MRI in chronic osteomyelitis? MRI provides better information for early detection of osteomyelitis than do other imaging modalities. MRI can detect osteomyelitis within three to the five days of the disease onset. Magnetic resonance image, uh, magnetic resonance image is as sensitive as and more specific than bone scintigraphy in the diagnosis of osteomyelitis. Nuclear imaging, nuclear imaging can help for in diagnosis of osteomyelitis. Technetium 99, BET, Indium, and gallium. Ultrasound, ultrasound imaging is helpful in localizing soft tissue apps. In the presence of metal implant, ultrasound may offer useful information uh, compared to CT and MR. Differential diagnosis of chronic osteomyelitis. General imaging differential consideration include charcoal joint, metastasis, Primary bone neoplasm like ulnar sarcoma, os sarcoma, lymphoma, multiple myeloma, Langhans cell histocytes. Treatment. What about the treatment? Present a treatment a, a, a team for the treatment of chronic osteomyelitis should be involved. The team is uh, inclusion surgeon, orthopedic and reconstructive surgery, an infectious disease specialist. A specialist to advise on a nutrition and a psychologist. The goal of treatment of chronic osteomyelitis is complete eradication of the infection, preservation of the soft tissue envelope, healing the bone segment, 
preservation of limb length discrepancy, discrepancy and the function. Number, number one, uh, antibiotic therapy or medical therapy, which was systematic and local antibiotic therapy. System, systemic antibiotic therapy, designed antibiotic therapy regimen is vital based on knowledge of cause of organism and spectrum of antimicrobial agents, the route of administration to achieve adequate levels in bone is important. Route of administration, antibiotics have good oral bioavailability and they can be given either orally or by intravenous route like fluoroquinolones, linzolid, Parental therapy provide high serum levels like kephalosporins. Some are only available for use parentally for form, uh, like broad spectrum kephalosporin, vancomycins, and amino glycosides. Duration of antibiotic. The standard recommendation for use of antibiotics about four to six weeks is being on animal study on time taken for vascularization of the bone. The duration of antibiotic use can be based on certain mother stage of the disease. In stage one and two, shorter course of antibiotic for two weeks may be adequate in conjugation with surgery. Stage three and stage four may need antibiotics for four to six weeks. The duration of antibiotic therapy should be individualized based on the clinical, hematological, and radiological response. Improve the cure rates with addition of free fampicin. The cure rate of chronic osteomyelitis is pleased with surgical resection of infected and devitalized tissue in conjugation with antibiotic therapy. Local antibiotic therapy, antibiotic impermeating cement beads help in the management of dead space, delivering a, high, delivering a high concentration of antibiotic locally. Biodegradable calcium sulfate containing topramycin is also used. The antibiotic uh, should to be used with uh, cement has to be heat stable and hydrophilic. Most commonly used antibiotic are gentamicin, topramycin, and vancomycin. What about surgical treatment? It includes adequate debridement, management of dead space, soft tissue coverage, skeletal stabilization and treatment of skeletal defect. You must achieve all these goals. Surgical department, the coronary stone for successful treatment of chronic osteomyelitis is aggressive surgical debridement. Most also recommend wide excision with clear vascular margin. About 28% uh, recurrence rate was seen if margins of resection was less than five millimeters. Dead space management. The dead space created after debridement should be managed probably. Various options are available include mobilization of local muscle flare, rotational muscle flare, or free muscle flare. Vacuum assisted closure is for a management of dead space. Use of antibiotic permanganated bone cement like muscular technique, which uh, Professor Ahmed Alam will talk after me. Soft tissue coverage. Offer a well vascularized soft tissue envelope. Microvascular free muscle transfer is considered the gold standard. Other option include rotational muscle flap. Skeletal stabilization and the management of skeletal defect. The preferred method of skeletal stabilization is external fixation. It may be possible to convert this into internal fixation after control of infection. At the option of antibiotic bone cement impermeated intramedullar nail, defect less than six centimeters can be bridged by autogenous bone graft like puppy new technique. Larger defects are best bridging by distraction osteogenesis using a lizard frame, external fixator, or vascularized bone graft. Vascularized fibrillar graft is time consuming, infection rate, and the fracture of the graft is one of the most complications. Techniques with Elizarf is induced membrane technique. This is about two stages. The first stage is the depredment of the bone and the complete resection of the devalized tissue. Then we put a cement impermanganated with antibiotic like vancomycin or tobamycin. Then 
after four to six weeks, there is good membrane is formed with good growth factors. What is about this, uh, this growth factor, this enhancement of the uh, uh, graft and uh, make the, uh, the, the, the death of the graft uh, is little. So as you see in this picture, this is the first stage which remove of the implant on hardware, then uh, both external fixator resolved, then uh, both uh, cement impermeated. Then after four to six weeks, we remove this uh, uh, cement and both combined iliac and uh, uh, fibular guilt. This paper was published by uh, us in the uh, SN Comprehensive Clinical Medicine this year. This is induced membrane technique used combined the free fibular and the area graft for the treatment of infected non-union of long bones of lower limb. Another technique is gradual fibular transfer. We uh, make three to four stages of this technique. The first stage, remove of the implant and remove of the bone and leave the uh, skin and soft tissue to be healed after uh, application of elizolf. Then second stage, we uh, do uh, osteotomy of the uh, fibula uh, and corresponding to the defect of the tibia. Then gradual transfer of the fibula with its cover by muscle and soft tissue and vascular supply. Then it becomes centralized from uh, the, 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 the posterior lateral to anteromedial. Then later on, we open according to the soft tissue. Then we put uh, uh, iliac graft on the two ends of the fibular graft. Like as you see, soft tissue coverage from here with granulation tissue. Then this is after the cupelization of the fibula with very good and sick uh, coaches. This is the paper which we are published, greater of fibrotransfer transfer in archives of somatic and trauma surgery by Elizar Fixin and Fixator on both traumatic and both infectious large tibial bone defect. Number three, the third technique, the corticotomy first technique associated with Elizar method, which was published by my great professor, Jamal Ahmed Hosni and our colleagues, uh, Abdel Salam, Abdel Alim, which uh, included by debridement and do bone corticotomy, then bone transfer, which is very, very effective method in the same setting and one stage in the treatment of chronic bone osteomyelitis. This is one of the techniques which we have uh, uh, tried by a compression destruction in result of techniques without debridement, which was accepted in orthopedic and traumatology, surgery and research uh, this year. In this technique, there is soft tissue uh, cover and the very bad skin and soft tissue. So we do what's called accordion technique without any debridement, and the result is, was very, very good. About this topic, I have discussed this topic with my professor Hosni, and he said that yes, it can unite in infected non-union, but chronic osteomyelitis uh, is still found. Uh, I remember that that Elizalf himself uh, said that the osteomyelitis burn out in the fire of new estrogens. This is a technique which was gradual distraction, then compression. For a half millimeter every day for four days, then compression for four days, then distraction, compression, about four cycles, then acute compression for two months. Adjuvant therapies, adjuvant therapies have been used in patient to improve blood supply, tissue perfusion, and the osteogenesis. The most tested being hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Improve the bacterial ability of the neutrophils and help this neutralize collagen senses and osteogenesis. Gene therapy and use of a growth factor like bone morphogenic proteins has been shown to accelerate osteogenesis and bone healing. 
Pulsed electromagnetic field, ultrasound, and deflected plasma have been used to promote bone and soft tissue healing. Thank you too much. Thank you. Prof. Ahmed. Thank you so much. Thank Our, uh... Thank you, Muhammad Antar. One moment, please. Yeah. You finished abruptly. You surprised yeah. us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very, very long the presentation because the topic is very, very large. Yes. Yeah. But you have a good uh, if you, presentation. If you have this topic, I, I, I am sure that you will talk 24 hours to cover it. Yeah. You have very, very good experience in this topic. Thank you. Thank you for your very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. I'm waiting for answers if there is any, um, uh, dear colleagues. I think you have uh, uh, put the light over the uh, main corners of the of the problem, uh, starting from the diagnosis till the treatment with different options. So I think we are good to go. Uh, um, Prof. Alam, would you like to share your screen? This is the uh, um, one of the management techniques of the chronic osteomalacia induced membrane technique and Prof. Alam will uh, yes. talk to us about it. Is working now? Yes. Okay, hi everyone. Indeed, this is not a true lecture. This will be some clinical experience and an applied tick, which we can call, this is a, a type of band modification for the classic muscular technique in the 4R. This is my disclosure. As you know, it is a major challenge to reconstruct a long wide diaphyseal defect, whatever the technique used. The most common used techniques are autologous bone grafting, and it is out of bone transport technique. Of course, there are a lot of other techniques. That is because the size of the non-vascularized bone graft is very critical. Diaphyseal defects larger than seven centimeters have incomplete healing because of the graft resorption, even in a good vascularized muscular envelope. So the foreign body induced membrane technique was introduced in 1986, and the clinical and experimental studies have shown that it can promote the consolidation of conventional cancellous bone autograft for reconstruction of long bone defects by making a very vascular, highly vascular, clean vascular bone. As you know, the classic musculo technique or the induced membrane technique is composed of two stages. In the first stage, we do very good aggressive bone and soft tissue debridement, removing all infected soft tissue and bones and putting bone cement, whatever with or without antibiotic and fixation of this with an external fixation. This external fixator when applied in the lower limb, tibia or femur has accepted rate of complications. This is the first stage. The second stage, we remove the cement as a fixator and do free non-vascularized graft and fix it whatever was brace or nick. As I said a few seconds before, this is very accepted in the lower limb. However, in the upper limb, we have more complications with external fixation post infection. This can occur including surgical difficulty in application in the upper limb because of the anatomical uh, limitations. Pentract infection have has higher incidence in the upper limb. Soft tissue injury is more in occurrence. Early loosening can occur more in the upper limb. And sometimes there's no enough space or a good bone stock for a frame to be applied in the upper limb for an infected radius or ulna. And this is a modified muscular technique or banana modification of muscular technique in the upper limb. It is a minimal internal fixation instead of the external fixation. Here are some cases for representation of the technique. This patient have infected ulna, severe infection, post infected blade, repeated debridement, removal of blade, repeated debridement, multiple sinuses, 
still having infection. As you see, very aggressive infection, huge amount of fibrous or fibrocartilage, which is heavily infected, occupying a space about seven centimeters in the ulna. This is during the resection of the tissues. We still have here after bone cut, still in the bed, we have infected tissues. This is a modification. After aggressive debridement and length adjustment of the bone, we put two heavy key wires, about two millimeters in diameter. They are long enough to stabilize the bone. They are like long bone stables, fix it in two planes, 90 degree to each other. Each long key wire or each stable is fix it by, by cortical fixation, by making a drill hole exactly the diameter of the K-wire. We can do the drill hole by the K-wire itself to be sure that we have the same diameter. So the K-wires can be put by press fit in this manner. Then we do bone cementation in the usual way and do little embedding of the K-wires in the cement to fix the construct. This is a video showing us the stability of the construct. This is after fixation of the K wires. We are moving the forearm into supination pronation. The construct is very stable. Another case with infection of a proximal segment of ulna. As you see, there is a huge subcutaneous abscess collection and degradation tissue after repeated debridement. When we open it for debridement, as you see, there is a lot of infected tissue all around, a lot of bone loss. And also, as you see, the proximal ulna is very defective to have fixation with any external fixator, this proximal segment. This is the first stage, aggressive debridement, putting the modified internal fixation construct cementation in the usual technique and the embedding of the key wires in the cement, different angle or photo. And this is also a video showing the stability of the construct. We are turning the forearm subination, pronation, this very stable construct. It is well seen. Excuse me, please, though, Professor Ahmed, the videos are not working. Videos are not working okay after we okay, finish no it is a technical problem after we finish the presentation there are about five videos yeah. we can stop the powerpoint and so the videos alone subsequent okay no problem. No problem. okay thank you another case this the radius more than one third of the radius is lost debridement application of the first k wire construct the second K wire and the bone cement. And also the video, I think we will say it is not working. Okay, it is not a problem. We will proceed. This is the first stage. The second stage goes as usual by putting, I usually do free non-vascularized fibular graft and augment with ilia graft or hydroxyapatite and fix whatever was plate or a meal. This study was conducted on about 16 cases with average defect of seven centimeters with a range from five to 11, all united in an average of 4.4 months. Infection was eradicated in all cases. Follow-up was with a range from two to 3.5 years with no refraction or infection recurrence in any of our cases done in Banha University hospitals. This is one of my cases after lengthening. This is a very fine case, very nice. This child is 10 years old. He has two large open infected fasciotomy wounds, three actively draining sinuses, infection of the middle two fifths of the ulna with large infection holes. After multiple debridement and removal of the plate and multiple reconstructive procedures, including a classic muscular technique with external fixation, fixation which failed also because of early loosening from severe pen tract infection. This is his X-ray. He is only 10 years old. 
This is the first stage of the debridement. This is the first K wire. This is the second K wire and the bone cement in place. This is an X ray during follow up. This video shows the vascularity of the bed at the time of removal of the cement. If it's not working, we will see it later. A seven centimeters free fibular graft was put. Then fix it with blade and added hydroxyapatite grafting. This is five months post fixation. This is a patient appearance and function. This is one year post operative with complete incorporation of the fibula and hydroxyapatite. This is two years later after blade removal. This is the X-ray with very nice ulna lens and consolidation with corticization and medullarization of the ulna. This is the patient three years later, appearance and function. Thank you. Now to the videos. If you follow me, Dr. Ahmed, to be sure yes. it is working. I will have this down to have the videos. Yes. This video is running, Dr. Ahmed. Sheikh? No, no, we still we still see no, the, the no. presentation. The presentation. Uh, okay, I will close the presentation. Okay. And try playing the video alone. One moment, please. You can stop share, please. Yeah, Ahmed. restart, restart the share for the video. Yeah, I will do. Stop it. Okay. Uh, okay now. Uh, yes. Try and open the first video. This is the first video running. We can see it. It's, no, it's no, no. blank it's for running. some reason. Still blank. Yeah. You see my screen now? Open no. with it. Open no. with this it. is my. Open with One moment. And open with. I may forget to share the screen. One no, you already, you already shared your screen. I am already sharing. You see yes. my desktop now? Yes. Yes. You see the pointer pointing to a video? Yes. yes. Right click. Maybe right click. Right click. Open with. Play. Play. Is going now? Mm -mm. No. Still no. Still no. We'll try another video. If not, I am very sorry for this. This one, still blank? It's also blank. Yeah. No. The share is working on? The share is working, but the video is black. OK. Uh, inshallah, I will make it on the Banha YouTube channel. I will make it available, inshallah. Okay. Or if you have time at the end of the day, I will check for the this technical problem. Okay. You have questions, Dr. Ahmed? Uh, yeah, let's take a couple of questions. Um, uh, what about what after infection subsides? You leave the cement or do a graft? Of course, we remove the cement and do a graft. It is long enough to be press fitting between bones. It could be augmented with can sell a spawn graft from the ileum or hydroxyapatite, then fix it with plate or nail according to your preference. How, how long between the first and second stage? How long the stage one? Yeah, between stage Usually one Usually it is six to 10 weeks. When you have clean ones, you have negative infection profiles, you can proceed to the second stage. Yeah, okay. Um, A question about the approach. Why was the last patient opened anteriorly? I'm not sure what the last patient uh, it was. The... You can open the radius anteriorly or posteriorly according to your preference. Yeah. It's not a matter of uh, anything. Uh, how do you apply wires like staples? This is something about the technique itself. Yeah. Okay. Suppose you have a defect seven centimeters. You will have a K wire after bending the straight part at least 
10 centimeters to be at least one centimeter from the bone edge. And you make a drill hole in the bone proximal, another one dress distal with the same K wire diameter and insert it like inserting a classic stable with light hammering to be fixed by cortical in the near and far cortex of the bone you are working on. Then another one longer to it, not to be in the same length, is applied 90 degrees in the opposite plane to it to be a stable construct and applied in the same way. Is this clear? Uh, yes, that's clear. Uh, last question about the, uh, uh, before going to the second stage, what, how would you monitor? Uh, would you suspect there is a recurrence of infection or non convalescence? Uh, do you request CBC, ESR, CRB, clinical picture, or you just you stick to the six weeks? We can stick to six, seven, eight, or 10 weeks according to the infection profile. You should have good ESR, negative CRP, and negative antistrepsilisin or titer. Yeah. Usually you have it maximum 10 weeks. Thanks so much, Professor Ahmed Alam, for this uh, wonderful talk. And uh, let's move to the final talk of our course with our uh, beloved uh, Professor Ahmed Thabit, Assistant Professor of Orthopedics, uh, Faculty of Medicine and Texas USA, about the non-union. So, uh, Prof. Ahmed Thabit, go on, please. Welcome, Excuse me, please, Ahmed. Uh, Dr. Ahmed Sheikh. I would like to uh, welcome my dear brother, Professor Ahmed Thabit, wish wishing you all the best in the United States. Uh, thank you all for your uh, introduction. Thank you. Very good talk. Really, I enjoyed the talks. Thank you, Professor Mohammed, the head of the department. Thank you so much for your uh, support. And uh, really, I appreciate the very good course. Very good topics. I enjoy it. Thank you. So let's go ahead and start it to avoid keeping you late. So today, I'm uh, supposed to assign to... Uh, you guys hear me very good? The yes. Voice? Yes. Okay. And the screen is obvious. You can see the yes. screen. Okay. Yes. So now we'll try to discuss about the non-unions. We have a very good introduction about the infections, how to diagnose infection, how to manage infections, how to deal with bone defects. We'll try to go over view about the principles of treating non-unions. So our objective today from the lecture to uh, go over the definitions of non-union or delayed union, uh, what the difference and how, when we, at, at what point we should diagnose non-union. Number two, the types of non-union, what are the different type of classification of non-unions and how to approach uh, and to do the evaluation for patient with non-unions and the basic principles of treatment. We'll try to go just touch the principle of treatment. So the definitions really is very important to define what's the definition of non-union, especially during research uh, and to try to do include patient with non-union. All the journal reviewers ask you how you selected the patient with non-unions is by x-rays or by time or both how you differentiate between delayed non-union delayed union and uh, non-unions. So non-union by definition is little bit is not very strict criteria for diagnosis. We can say it is a fracture that is not uh, currently healed and is not going to heal. That's a little bit of uh, broad uh, definition of non-unions. Delayed unions, uh, a fracture that requires more time than usual to heal. Uh, and show, uh, shows the healing progress over time. As the time goes, the healing progress and become better over time that we can diagnose this as non-unions. The other definition by the FDA was the definition of non-unions. It said I need the FDA requires a minimum of nine months post occurrence of fracture to call it non-unions. And the fracture is not healed and has not shown radiographic progression of healing for the last three months. Three months. Little bit, this is because you, uh, the FDA requires nine months. During that time, we leave the patient without treatment. The patient has pain, can rely on pain medications, narcotic abuse, and also the patient is out of work, is not able to work, is not able to walk on his feet or his leg, and has a limitation of the knee motion or the joint motion because of this time frame. So and kind of also, this is not a pragmatic or not a realistic uh, definition. The other definition, also, can we uh, define non-unions that we, after look at the X-ray, we, at uh, the surgeon or the surgeon or the treating team, decided that this fracture is not going to heal without any further intervention. That this fracture we can call it non-unions. Look at the X-ray. Yeah, this fracture will not heal, but need more more grafting, more revision of fixation, need further treatment. 
at that point, we can call it uh, non-unions. For myself, at least in my I do, I wait for at least six months before call it non-unions. And also I look for the progress progression of feeling over the x-rays. I see the patient six weeks and then three months and then another visit uh, six every, every six weeks. And then after this, if I couldn't see progression of healing over the um, consecutive x-rays, I call it non-union. I start discussion with the patient that we need further treatment, either bone graft, revision or fixation. We have to do something to achieve uh, full healing. So the classification of bone healing of uh, non-unions, we can call it uh, that could be hypertrophic with the body, try to heal the fracture. However, the mechanical environment is not enough to achieve full healing. So stop at certain point causing the hypertrophic non-unions. The other point is oligotrophic non-unions. There is a body trying to heal the fracture, but not as strong as uh, the hypertrophic. And uh, we can see the, still the fracture line is still in the x-rays. You can let it, you can see in the x-rays, little bit of callus formation under fracture. We call it high oligotrophic uh, non-unions. Atrophic non-union or a vascular non-union. This is a complete uh, a loss of vascularity around the fracture ends. And uh, there is no healing of the body. Uh, there is no attempt for the body to heal the fracture. We call it atrophic non-unions. And the fourth type, this is subtype, or you can call it different type from uh, atrophic non-unions. But the pseudoarthrosis type, we can see in this extra in this video, you look at the fracture, the fracture is, or the non-union is mobile all over the places. In coronal plane, in sagittal plane, you can see the, the fracture or the non-union site is completely uh, mobile at the, uh, at the non-union site. The hypertrophic, the fracture, this is, we can see in this x-rays, you can see a little bit of a callus formation around the fracture. The bone is vascularized. There is a callus formation in present the x-rays and due to the shape of the hypertrophic or the excessive callus around the fracture, there is a called elephant foot or abundant callus formation or horse hoof depending on the amount of the callus formation around. So in this fracture, there's a good biological response of the body. However, the mechanical environment is not enough so in order to treat this fracture, as we will discuss in further slides, we have to adjust to the mechanical envi environment. And we can see also this drawing, the type of hypertrophic or oligotrophic uh, non-unions, uh, non-union. The oligotrophic, this is, you can see this is patient of femur, mid shaft femur fracture with IM nail. And you can see some or minimum callus formation X-ray, not aggressive healing response like the uh, hypertrophic non-unions. And also the vas there is a vascularity is a present in the bone scan as well. The atrophic non unions, this is, we can see this an ankle fracture. There is no evidence of callus formation on x ray. And also on bone scan, it's a cold scan or uh, ischemic uh, because of the disturbed vascularity at the fracture site. And there is no enough biology. And also, the mechanical environment may be too stiff, or uh, there is infections causing bone distraction or bone gap causing the dis uh, disturbed vascularity of the bone ends, also can contribute to the non union or atrophic non unions. And the zoot arthrosis, as we can see in this fracture, this is the x-ray, you can see also the humerus, you can see the movement of the fracture in all planes. And this is the pseudo arthrosis type with the broken uh, IM nail for a humerus fracture, as well with the uh, broken implants or broken nails. So typically has adequate vascularity, there is excessive motion or instability at the non-union site. There is a false joints form over a significant time. If the patient has, this is on for five years or six years or 10 years, the body, there is a excessive uh, false joint at this area. And uh, this is just the x-ray to show you the different type of non-unions. And this is also the one showing you the uh, type of pseudoarthrosis or non-unions. And this is the other classification also that Dr. Bailey used to uh, do it. There is type one. Uh, non-unions with the type one and uh, type A, I'm sorry, type A and type B. And the type A has a bone defect less than one centimeter of bone loss. Type one A is mobile union, uh, non-unions, like the same we have this picture. And type two, the stiff or hypertrophic non-unions is there is no movement at the fracture site that's called non-mobile with or without deformity. This is subcategories of the stiff non-unions. The other one with the bone defect over a centimeters, there's a, bone defect but no shortening and uh, type b2 is a shortening no bony defect and type 2 but uh, type b3 is bone def bony defect and shortening both and this is a more uh, the higher the grade of non-unions the more complex 
the reconstruction reconstructive surgery needed to achieve healing of the fracture site. And in the biomechanics of non-unions, we have to look at the patient as uh, as a as a whole look at the bigger picture is not just that the bone was not healed, but there is something wrong that is going on either at the implants we used or, or the fracture site or the patient himself has something uh, is not rightly to be addressed. We have important factors for consideration. We look for biologic, biologic and mechanical environment. That's a presence or, a presence of, or absence of infection. Could be aseptic or aseptic non-unions. And this is, this is a fracture. This is a non-union I take care of. This is the, you can see the sequestrum after bony resection. This is the resection of bone, and this is the sequestrum causing the resistance of non-unions. Also have to consider for the vascularity at the fracture site. You can look at this with the preoperative imaging or interoperative, look at the bleeding at the non-union site or the fracture and all look for the stability of the environment. Look at the soft, at the entire picture of the patients. And the etiology, direct abusers and devastation factors contribute to whole factors. A fracture or injury, open fractures definitely is uh, one of the major reasons for uh, non-unions. Initial treatment, also how much, how good we, when we did the initial surgery, did we do excessive periosteal stripping at the both sides of the fracture? What would we, uh, what the impact of the initial surgery on the bone healing? And the complicating factors as infections, as we discussed in the in this lecture and the previous lectures as well. So the etiology of non-unions, the host factors. We have a smoking is very very important. Look for the patient. You have to tell the patient if you are seriously want to quit smoking or you want to treat your fracture. You try to uh, counsel the patient about the smoking. Very important as well. Hormones and uh, the hormones and the other related conditions like diabetes, mellitus, thyroid, parathyroid disorders, all these factors affecting the bone health, affecting the blood supply to the fracture end, and contribute to the bone healing. And uh, testosterone, estrogen deficiency, and this is also the high topic we discuss in all conferences, the vitamin D deficiency or calcium. So you have also maybe to consider uh, ordering uh, uh, vitamin D3 or 125 vitamin D uh, in the blood to check the patient vitamin D also give the patient supplementation of uh, calcium and vitamin D as well. Malnutrition, medications like steroids, chemotherapy, uh, radiotherapy, antivirals, anticonvulsant, immunosuppressive, bone quality uh, at osteoporosis and the vascular status and the balance of the patient has a neuromuscular conditions, uh, psychiatric condition, all these factors can contribute to non-unions. Smoking, uh, is very important, uh, either a smoke cigarettes or cigar or chewing tobacco or different kind of uh, smoking, decrease peripheral oxygen tension, it slow down the peripheral blood flow to the limb, well-documented difficulties in wound healing in patient who smokes, that's well-documented in literature. Uh, diabetes is very important, it's very common in Egypt and very common in the US as well here, so we have to look for the blood sugar control and look for not just the uh, fasting blood glucose, you have to look, check also for the hemoglobin A1C and to try to, before jumping for other treatment for non-unions, ask the patient if they're uh, to check the hemoglobin A1C to give you a better control over three months and try to target the correction before doing the surgery, hemoglobin A1C less than 7.5 or around that time at least, or seven, if you can get it to down to seven. So blood diabetes affecting the blood, sub, the blood supply to the, uh, to the extremity, affecting the, uh, uh, the bone healing capacity of the patients and has a serious uh, consequences on the, uh, on the bone healing and the soft tissue healing in patient with the diabetic, especially a patient with the uh, renal uh, dysfunction on diabetic neuropathy as well. And can also for ankle, a distal tibia fracture, patient can also develop a charcot arthropathy or a neuropathic feet that also can contribute on also to non-unions as well. Uh, malnutrition is very important and also you have to look for the other side of malnutrition, obesity patient, the obese patient, they beg, but they should, but also they could be also malnourished and you have to look for some objective test also if you want to check the serum albumin, total lymphocyte count and the albumin less than 3.5 or lymphocyte less than 
1500 cells per, ml, per milliliter is a significant number for uh, indicator for malnutrition and also have to encourage high protein diet and improve the patient nutrition as well. That's important. So the bottom line regarding our fracture, there's a four major factors important for non-union generation. Number one, fracture gap. There's a gap, there's a fracture distracted or not, either small gap or bigger gap, that's a fracture gap. And uh, the vascularity of the blood supply, if the patient has an open fracture, the patient has a prior surgeries with two approaches, like a tibial plateau, medial approach, and lateral approach, felon fractures has two approaches or three, I mean, different approaches or different surgeries, all this can disturb the blood supply. If the patient has the vascular problems, also can distribute diabetic patient to vascularity at the fractures so is very important and the infections and instability is uh, poor fixation is also can cause the non-union. So this is the major four factors for non-unions, fracture gap, vascularity, infection, and inadequate fixation or instability at the fracture site. That's uh, the four factors or local factors that contribute to the uh, uh, non-unions. Also some fracture pattern has, uh, I, I had um, some fracture pattern at high risk of developing non-unions and especially patient with the high energy in a high energy fractures that was a fracture comminution was bone loss segmental patterns also have a higher degree of soft tissue and bone ischemia and at risk of uh, non-unions acute compartment syndrome also associated with tibial plateau tibial shaft fractures at higher risk of developing uh, non-unions as well we can see also open fractures the higher the degree of open fractures the the more risk of uh, non-union as well. We have to be aware of this. And also sometimes when I know that the risk of fracture uh, for non-union is higher in this certain certain pattern of fractures, I tell the patient that you need a bone graft three months from now. And instead of a complication of treatment, I get a planned bone graft down the road that the patient need a secondary bone graft uh, six to 12 weeks post-operative to uh, avoid uh, the occurrence of non-unions. Uh, also, as a surgeon, also we can contribute to the uh, non-unions by being aggressive with poor soft tissue handling techniques, uh, improper fixation. The cornerstruct is too stiff. You, know, you put both the screws in every hole of the plate, causing too stiff cornerstruct, or you put too little fixation. Unstable fixation also can uh, causing the uh, the uh, non-union as well. So we can contribute to either too stiff cornerstruct with a gap or uh, bone reduction techniques or relative stability with excessive motion at the fracture site causing uh, non-unions as well. So also certain fractures are at risk of the location of the fracture. No matter we did a good job in fixation, addressing the patient uh, general factors, there are certain locations, no matter we do, uh, it, at risk of developing uh, non-unions. This is the distal TB as a classic presentation with a poor blood supply and uh, bore soft tissues around the ankle or the distal TB at risk of developing a non-unions. Joint fracture, the fifth, the, uh, the, the shaft of the fifth metatarsal fractures as well with the foot, joint fracture at risk of blood supply of non-unions, femur neck fracture, scaphoid at risk of non-unions as well. And also uh, the lateral condyle in children can also cause non-unions as well. We can see this is different type of uh, non-unions in different locations. We know that these fractures are at higher risk of non-unions as well. This is lateral condyle. We can see the lateral condyle is displaced and rotated. This is the articular surface is rotated into the fracture site, causing the risk of non-union is very high. Also, this is a patient with a transcervical femoral neck fracture. We did a screw fixation and the patient still has uh, non-union as well. Also the open fracture, we know that open fractures at risk of developing non-union as well. Infection is a major, uh, is a very, very important. I think it's covered in the prior lectures, very good either diagnosis uh, or with the, uh, well, with the other talk regarding the treatment and approach. So I want to spend too much time, but infection is a worst complication you can get. It causing non-unions complicate all the reconstructive surgery that needed down the road also can be difficult in the setting of infection as well. So infection can be very obvious in the first acute infection with a draining, with a erythema, with a swelling, patient has fever, has rigors or chills. So sometimes very obvious, but also sometimes it's not very obvious and need to do the uh, workup to rule out infection as a, as a, 
as a reason for non-unions. So you have to uh, have a high index of a suspicious ESR and CRB. We said is is good to monitor, but it's not for diagnosis. I think the ultimate uh, diagnosis you have to see the organism itself. You take bone biopsy, and also very important check that you have to ask the lab to leave the culture for at least two weeks for a slow growing organism because if the organism is too strong, usually present with more obvious infection like a staph or stuff like that. But the low grow, a low a low virulence organism need a slow cultures at least two weeks to rule out the infection. So infections, we consider any patient with non-unions, especially post-operative was after prior surgeries infected until proved otherwise. So we have to deal with this. As we said at the last, uh, the mentioned in the lot prior lectures, if you are in doubt, treat as infection. So we have to do the debridement, the debridement, the debridement, and have to uh, uh, deal with the defect after the debridement because this is the, uh, because once you do the resection and the debridement, you have a bone defect, you need to deal with it. Either with bone transport, with internal fixation, you have to deal with the bone defect as well. So patient evaluation for non-unions, you have to look for the prior history of the patients with history of injury, prior treatment, medical history, comorbidity factors, physical exam, including deformity, and also advanced imaging like a CT or MRI, depending on the situation you need. This is the CT with the distal humerus non-unions. You can see the fracture uh, non-unions, very obvious on the 3D reconstruction and the CT uh, uh, cuts. And also talk to the patient, what the goals of the patient. If the patient need one surgery, like need amputation or need to, re to save his leg and we have to do multiple surgeries to achieve healing, you have to talk to the patient to discuss with him the expectation from the surgical intervention. Uh, I think already the previous talk discussed about the different type of uh, chronic osteomyelitis and you have to, but uh, in addition to uh, understand the type of osteomyelitis, you have to know your host. The uh, host A is a healthy immune system. Host B is a locally compromised or systematic system, have a systematic uh, or systemic compromise that diabetes, cancer, steroid therapy. Local has a patient with a very close veins, peripheral vas vascular disease and neuropathy. And host C, is a treatment is worse than treatment uh, is worse than the disease. In this case situation, we don't recommend surgical intervention. Uh, also, the MRI is very important, especially with the uh, setting of infections. And also, we have the other PET scan CT as a prior lectures to rule out infection. So at the end, you can develop this checklist. So the checklist, you have to look at the patient with non-unions, uh, look for patient information, mechanism of injury, date of injury, uh, the job of the patient, the pain, and also look for the prior surgery, how many surgeries the patient did. If there is a patient has infection or not. Medical, com medical uh, conditions, soft tissue reconstructions, all these factors, patient is non steroidal or not, narcotic use or not, allergies, all these factors at the end of the, the checklist, you have to know that type of non-unions, either hypertrophic, oligotrophic, atrophic, infected, synovial zoodarthrosis, that's uh, at the end of the, your evaluation, you have this information in your hand. So treatment of non-unions could be non-operative or operative treatment. And also you have to make sure that the infection is ruled out as we can see in this picture as well. So non-operative management, we uh, sometimes need a casting or just electrical stimulation, low pulse ultrasound or extracorporeal shockwave therapy. Sometimes in patient with the uh, it's difficult to say delayed union or uh, or straightforward non-unions, they can get benefit of this medication, uh, of this uh, of these lines of treatment and operative management. However, the uh, the value of this this treatment is not as strong as the operative management. Most of us just rely on operative treatment. So the operative, operative treatment, you have to after you have your checklist you know now the type of non-union you are dealing with, if hypertrophic or atrophic or with infections with pseudoarthrosis. If there's an infection, the first line is debridement and hardware removal. And then you have to revise your internal fixation as Dr. Alam presented in his case, you did the debridement, hardware removal, temporize the patient with the stables, with, with external fixator who was cast, and then come back to the second stage with the plate osteosynthesis or intermediary nailing or external fixation, whatever the other treatment. And also you have to achieve bone healing. We're using the improve the biology using the bone grafting, uh, either electrolysis bone graft or from the femur 
bone marrow aspirate, allograft, hydroxyapatite, whatever the, you have access to to improve the local biology of the fractures uh, at the non-union site. And also decortication is very important. This is a patient, you can see in this picture, the patient has the sequestrum, you can see the sequestrum. It's very obvious, and this after debridement of all the dead tissue, the infected tissue, we can see there is a huge defect around six centimeters of defect, and this uh, need the reconstruction either with the muscular technique or bone transport or different uh, uh, options of reconstruction of bone defects. So autogenous bone graft from the iliac crest. This is the oldest gold standard for bone grafting. You take the iliac crest, do the take the bone graft. Uh, it could be osteoconductive and osteogenic and osteoconductive as well to help with the uh, uh, with the bone with the reconstruction of the bone defect uh, after the debridement and resection. This is another technique we used like a uh, few years ago, and this is using reaming the femur and aspirating all the bone graft uh, to get the uh, bone graft from the femur to avoid the pain, the bony spike at the iliac crest and also have a bigger access to bigger amount of bone grafting. So the rear or the reamer irrigator aspirator bone grafting technique also is uh, the new technique, give you a greater volume, less operative time, no difference in union rates between the iliac crest and the other uh, bone grafting harvesting technique, less expensive for large defects because if you do two iliac crest and the patient has like five surgeries before and had a bone graft from the two iliac crests and then you have to go to a posterior iliac crest on both sides and you still don't have the amount you need. So sometimes this will give you uh, a better amount of bone graft. Also less donor, morbid less donor mor site morbidity. And this is a question mark because some people develop fractures of when, you're, when you ream the femur with bigger reamer, the femur become weaker and also you're at risk of developing uh, fractures of the femur or the femoral neck uh, after the harvesting the bone graft from the femur. More significant complication also the fat embolism, but there is aspiration and you, you, it's a reamer and irrigation and aspiration at the same time. The risk of fat embolism is less uh, compared to the regular reaming for nails. The uh, surgical fixation strategy, once you define that the non-union type, hypertrophic or oligo or atrophic or pseudoarthrosis, you have to look for the fracture location, diaphysis versus metaphysis. Diaphysis me means nail, uh, nailing. Metaphysis most of the time need plates, infected versus non-infected. There's a deformity or not, patient factor and host factors, goals and expectation as well. So the, and then if you look for the metaphysial fractures, uh, maybe most of the time there is need for plates. So the correction of malalignment with osteotomy may be need to uh, help with the correction of the deformity. Also need compression at the non-union site to help with the, uh, achieve, to achieve healing uh, and allow immediate mobilization with the uh, adjacent joint range of motion. Uh, but most likely because of the plate, you need downward bearing and they require uh, adequate soft tissue coverage because the plate need more dissection. Most of the time bone graft is needed. Uh, dynamization of nails is, is of a limited value. People, some use dynamization of nails only the first few months after the surgery, after three months, four months. The value of dynamization of nail, of uh, IM nail is not as good as you expect. Uh, also the exit change nailing also is uh, important uh, to look, consider uh, replacing the tin nail. If you have a tin nail in the prior surgery, you can go with a bigger nail, 12 nail or bigger nail to achieve more uh, stiffness and stability of the non-union site. And also the reaming of the canal is, uh, is helpful to uh, harvest the bone graft around the non-union non site as well. 90% success rate in tibial non-unions management. But this paper, they addressed the other factors like vitamin D deficiency, thyroid hormone, parathyroid hormone factors. And they have a very good success for non-unions for tibial shaft fracture after IM nail also is very helpful. This is just a small case through the exchange nailing where they can see this a patient has, uh, is uh, riding a horse and a horse races and fell off the horse, have subtrochanteric fracture, has uh, interim battery nail fixed with the reconstruction nail with a small bullet holder reduction. And 10 months after follow-up, the patient continued to have pain, limping, and ha he has the x-ray non-unions. 
So this patient went back for surgery. We did the extension. This is a, the rear bone grafting before the, uh, uh, after the, taking the nail off and then take the bone graft from the femur, as we can see in the picture on the left, and then put another nail, bigger nail. So the patient has 12, uh, 10 nail, 10.5, 10 nail, and this nail is 11.5, bigger nail to achieve the uh, healing. And then this is a lengthening nail. This is a different nail. This is a little bit of different technique, but you can do back slab of the nail and compress the fracture site. But this, we choose a different technique using the precise nail and then do the shortening or compression at the fracture site. And you can see the bending of the screws because how this is how we, we achieve very good compression at the fracture site. And uh, we did the bone graft at the non-union site as well. And then we were able to, there's a good healing, medial cortex, lateral cortex. You can see a little bit of sclerotic line, the fracture line, you can see it, but there is an anterior cortex and a little bit of a posterior cortex. And this is the patient with the rust score was uh, different. This is the score that we use for, uh, to assist the, the healing of the fracture is the patient has a clinical improved, has no pain, his limb being improved. And he went back to horse riding uh, to do the racing of the horses. External fixator as well can be very helpful for bone transport, for compression, the fracture site, for the uh, compression distraction technique, as uh, Dr. Anter or Professor Anter mentioned. It's very important also to, for compression distraction technique, can correct the deformity, can help with the reconstruction of bone defects, can avoid the surgical exposures uh, for the internal fixation like plates. All this kind of techniques can be used, but you have to choose a treatment that uh, is good for your patient. And external fixator is very good also in the setting of infections as well. Uh, so in summary, so the definition of, you have to be careful about the diagnosis of non-unions. Uh, a fracture has not, has, uh, that has not, and is not going to heal without further intervention. Try to look at the progressive lack of progressive healing. I don't like to wait for nine months or a year to call it non-unions. I like to uh, do the intervention a little bit earlier. If I didn't see the healing progressive over consecutive x-rays, I try to do something to achieve bone healing for these patients. Also remember the types of healing have been hypertrophic, oligotrophic, atrophic, or pseudoarthrosis. Uh, look for the assessment, the host, the injury fracture, prior treatment, infected or not. Do the assessment exam, uh, radiograph, CT, MRI, serological markers to rule out infections, treatment, address what is lacking, the biology or the mechanical or both. So you have the biology is atrophic non-unions, you need bone graft and then fixation. With the hypertrophic, the biology is good, but the mechanical environment is not good. You have to address by internal fixation. Also, you have to address the uh, treatment for the systemic systematic factors like osteoporosis, uh, like uh, hormonal deficiency, good uh, control of blood sugars, or uh, also the um, ultrasound, the electrical, uh, uh, the local magnetic field or electrical stimulation uh, current for to achieve healing is very important as well. We have to revise also look for the uh, implants option, either plates, nail fixators are uh, very helpful to achieve the healing of the fracture site. It's difficult cases. I need to be uh, patient and uh, honest with the patient to tell him that it will take up, up to a year to achieve healing, maybe more. And uh, I hope you guys, uh, yeah, have a good information. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Professor Ahmed Thabit, for this uh, uh, conclusive talk, really. Uh, you took us through a, a very uh, good journey through the non-union. Uh, let's take uh, some few questions to enrich the, the content more and more. Uh, first question is about the, the effect of the fracture fixation on the union. Is there a, 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 um, a effect or difference? The, uh, the different types of fixation methods will affect the union of the fracture? Uh, definitely, depending on what fracture you're looking for, is the fracture in the shaft or the metaphysis, diaphysial versus metaphysial fractures. Most of the metaphysial fracture we use nails, and if the fracture gap, if you use the nail properly and do the back slab or the compression of the nail, that's a good technique as well. But uh, if you use a plate and you have a, you didn't compress the plate very good, or you don't use a proper technique uh, like less minimally invasive techniques with the disturbances of the extensive soft tissue disturbances, also you may create non-unions of the fracture site. 
We've also used internal fixation, the setting of bad open fracture, highly contaminated fractures. Also, you may just calling for infection to happen. And this also may affect the outcome of the surgical treatment of, uh, of the fracture. Yeah, in the clinical scenario that you're, you're fixing a fracture and there is some gap in the fracture uh, um, site after fixation, uh, how, um, how many millimeters would you leave without deciding that you should do acute bone grafting or just leave it alone and it will heal? It's a, it's a very complex question, but it's a, it's a real case scenario. Yeah, I try to avoid any gaps as much as I can. If I use uh, IM nails for transverse fracture, I try to do the distal locking first, use back slap to compress it as much as I can. And some nails has a compression mechanism. You can compress it from the top with a, a compression mechanism. And also uh, with the, uh, is, uh, using the forearm, the cases like forearm fractures, I try if the transverse fracture, I use uh, eccentric, the, the classic AO technique for compression plating as well. But try to avoid any gaps as much as I can. If I'm using external fixators, also try to um, compress the fracture, do the compression distraction techniques if I can. Recently, there's a different technique, reverse dynamization. You start dynamization early on instead of dynamize before frame removal. Uh, this is another technique also you can use it to help with the, uh, uh, with the healing by, by secondary bone healing, not primary bone healing. Uh, you have already mentioned effect, negative effect of the smoking and the patient should be counseled about it, should stop it. And vitamin D, what about nystroidal anti-inflammatory? It's a bit controversial. Does it uh, share in the non-union or not? Uh, I mean, this is, I mean, uh, the animal study showing that the nonsteroidal is, is not uh, affected the, the healing of the fracture because of the prostaglandins and the anti-inflammatory response. But most of the clinical studies does not have a proof for using the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. But definitely, I try to avoid using non-steroidal, especially if the patient has a risk factors like a smoker, is diabetic. But if the younger child, I know this young patients, I know that the healing is expected to happen normal. I may give him a very short course of non-steroidal if needed. But I try to stay away from. Yeah. Uh, a very common scenario also about the uh, interleukin dynamization. Uh, there are, you see a couple of patients uh, that uh, dynamize, non-united, plate, renal. Uh, I think about the decision making. What is the best option for this patient? Uh, what, what do you think about dynamization and its effect or you would go for the graft or change the, phase of the method of the fixation? I think early on, if you catch the dynamization very early on, it, be, it could be useful, but if you wait for after over six months of a year and try to do dynamization very late in, this, in the treatment, I don't think there's a fibrous tissue. There's a lot of tissue at the fracture site is not, will not be as you expect. You need to be more strong either. There's multiple techniques. Some people do it exchange nailing, do back slap to reduce it. Other people, I mean, in the UK, I think Muhammad, uh, there's a paper in the GP bone and joint surgery using external fixator monolateral frame around the nail and try to do the compression around with the, uh, around, they don't remove the, the nail. They keep the nail and put external fixator around the nail and they try to compress as much as they can. Recently, for this fracture, I take the whole nail off, put a precise nail in, in a distraction mode I try to compress as, as much as we can, intraoperative and postoperative, you do compression as well. There is multiple techniques you can address it to achieve the, the compression you need. And bone grafting. Yeah. But remember, you see the picture we see if the patient have the, did the open the fracture non-union site, uh, look, there's a sequestrum. It's so like an open fracture. There's a sequestrum. There's bad soft dish, uh, bad bone around the non-union site. Whatever you do, this is not, not here. So you have to be open the non-union site, look at, at the non-union site and decide what the good tissue, what the bad tissue. The good tissue has to go. Yeah, yeah you have to be more radical. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, last thing about another, another thing which is controversial, alindronate role in promoting union or is it, does, is it against union or not alindronates? Or, I think most or the... try to avoid it in the first three, four months because osteoclast is very important for bone healing and remodeling of bone. I think most of the people try to uh, stay away from it at least four months post injury. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks so much for having us for this um, rich discussion as usual. And we, we really appreciate your participation and your presence today. Thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation. Thank you. Uh, Professor Alam, we got your videos. Let me share my screen and hopefully Please. this will Sorry go for well this, this time. Try, please. Let me.
Is it okay? It's still can you working. see something? No, still, we can really? see the, the, the see videos, it? but it's not working, Dr. Ahmed. Inside, Ahmed. Yeah. Press on it. Make it, you can change just. the extension, Windows Media Player. Just, just let me try. Present in another mood. Change its extension. What about this? No, change this. Yeah. Yes, yes. I see it now. Okay. We were talking about the modification of the first stage of muscular technique or induced membrane technique. This is how stable this internal construct is. The second video, please, Dr. Ahmed. Okay. Just a bit, uh, need to open the video first and then share it. The same change the extension, please. See yes, it? yes. This is the second case, was also showing the stability of the construct, no movement at all. The third one. Okay, we're also showing the stability of another case with a long effect about nine centimeters in a radius in a heavy patient. No motion at all at the bone cement interface, proximal or distal. Okay, we will move now to the vascular bit. I think the next video. No, no, this is the fitting of the graft. I want you to hear the click of fitting. Can you open the sound, Dr. Ahmed? I'm, I'm opening it already. It is not working, I have no sound. It, it is fashioned to fit the shape of the missed bone, not just transverse cut, you refashion it to be well fitting. Yes, the fashioned as you see, or transverse cut is fashioned according to the shape of lost bone. If you want to remove it, it is very fixed because you make it press fit. Okay, the last one showing the vascular bit and the arteriolar refilling, not capillary refilling of the very, very well vascularized bed after removal of the cement. The last. It is not shared yet, Dr. Ahmed, please. The last one, I think. No, no, not this. You presented I've this. I've shared all of them. Um, the, the last one I sent to you, number five. These are the six that I have. I've already played all of them. You have five or four? I had six. Six? Okay, you, ha you have one which appears green before you start it on the screen. It is green. The first appearance before working looks green. Okay, it is not important. It shows the vascular bit after removal of the cement. I just showing you make compression with your finger like the capillary filling test and you show Bletching of the field and refilling of many arterioles inside the floor of the field. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Ahmed. Thank, thank you. you. Professor we Ashab, to conclude the Professor Ashab, course. our head of department. Thank you so much, yes. Professor Alam. Uh, now we come to the end of the international LRS course. Uh, I hope uh, you enjoyed it and it was beneficial for all of you as it was beneficial for us also. Uh, finally, I would like to thank all our international guest speakers from uh, UK and from USA, and of course, our national speakers from Banha or Orthopedic uh, Department, and the uh, deformity planning course uh, is uh, 
very enriched by the uh, LRS unit in our department with its head, Professor Ahmed Alam. And many thanks to my uh, dear brother, Professor Ahmed Sheikh, the organizer of the course. For no his, for his, thank you so much. Thank you so much. He, he made a, a great effort to organize okay. this uh, marvelous course. Uh, now to we come to the end of the first section of Banha online orthopedic course, which is the orthopedic section. But still, we have a surprise for you, which is the final day of the course, which is the Talipas day. It will be on uh, Friday, next Friday, uh, uh, discussing all the topics of Talipas with six eminent speakers discussing seven topics about Talipas equinovirus. Talipas equinovirus from A to Z, meet the expert. I hope it will be beneficial for all of you. And by this marvelous day, we come to the end of the orthopedic section of Banha online orthopedic review course. Now we come to the next section of the course, which is the trauma course. I promise you it will be very, very uh, efficient course uh, containing more than uh, maybe uh, 50 national and international guest speakers discussing all the topics of trauma. Uh, it will uh, be opened officially uh, on uh, Wednesday, 11 of November. Uh, I hope it will be beneficial for all of you. Uh, finally, at the end of the course, from myself, uh, Professor Mohammed Al Ashab, head of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Banha University Hospital, and the chairman of the course, uh, and all my department staff, I wish you all the best and hope to see you in trauma course. And good night for all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, thank you. Thank, thank you, you, Professor Ahmed Sabit. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you.